Hello, my name is Heron. I work at Political Research Associates where I monitor the anti-LGBTQ right. Today, I'm gonna to tell you a story about January and February and March of this year, but first, I have to scare you a little bit, you know, for the drama. So, I'm here to talk to you about anti-trans activists who root their rhetoric in so-called feminism and how these activists are collaborating with the US right, particularly the US Christian right, advocacy organizations and right-wing media to give anti-transgender advocacy the veneer of bipartisanship. When I say they're partnering closely together, I mean it. This is an allograph mapping the connections between US right-wing organizations, media, and spokespeople with the prominent anti-trans feminist activists in the US, UK, and Canada. Obviously, you're not really meant to be able to read these. This is just me trying to intimidate you with how smart I am and what an incredible researcher I am and what work I've done over the past year. This is just the scary part. I'm gonna go through the middle in a second, but this is the scary part where I tell you that the US right and the UK and Canada rights are deliberately partnering with anti-trans feminist activists to drive a wedge in the LGBT community. So, one last really scary thing before I get to the storytelling part. This is US right-wing media coverage of anti-trans feminist activists and organizations over the past five years. There's been an overall increase since the election and a dramatic spike in the past few months covering the events I'm going to share with you this evening. All right, it's story time. Gather around, children. In late January, Heritage Foundation hosted its second panel of anti-transgender so-called feminists to talk about how the Equality Act would supposedly endanger the safety of women and girls. For those not familiar, the Equality Act is federal legislation that would prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in housing, employment, credit, and places of public accommodation. 21 states have these laws, but there is no federal law that prohibits discrimination across the country. Before we get into the whys and the whats, because I can see questions in the audience bubbling to the surface, let's just go through the speakers. Julia Beck there, on your far left, was kicked off the Baltimore City LGBTQ Commission Law and Policy Committee because she was so virulently anti-trans. Jennifer Chavez and Kara Dansky, they're on the board of the Women's Liberation Front. Kara is a former ACLU attorney who now writes anti-trans amicus briefs in her spare time to the Supreme Court. Hoxie Hovarth is a lecturer of epidemiology at UCSF and a regular on the anti-trans circuit. And of course, our dear friend Ryan T. Anderson, he's senior research fellow at Heritage and author of When Harry Became Sally. <laughs> I get it. Responding to the transgender moment, Ryan T. Anderson organizes much of Heritage's anti-trans programming. So a tiny bit of background for our story. In 2016, Women's Liberation Front announced it would be taking $15,000 from Alliance Defending Freedom to help file an amicus brief in the Gavin Grimm case. That's the high school boy who just wanted to use the boys' bathroom at his school. Kara Dansky applied for and facilitated that funding. Hmm, 
$15,000 from one of the biggest Christian right organizations in the entire country to a radical feminist women's organization. A week after the email went out in 2016 to Wolf membership, another email went out announcing that the org would also be writing a brief in tandem with Family Policy Alliance, a, quote, conservative Christian organization whose mission is to advance biblical citizenship, equip and elect statesmen, promote policy, and serve an effective alliance, all committed to a common vision. That quote I just quoted from, that's not actually on Family Policy Alliance's website. That was in the email going from the women's leadership uh, the Women's Liberation Front to their membership. So here's Kara Dansky, who spoke at Heritage in January, talking with Family Policy Alliance Director Autumn Leva. Here's what Kara said. I think we disagree on a lot of things. Wolf stands unapologetically for reproductive sovereignty, for gay rights, for marriage equality, and I think that our organizations disagree on those issues. But on certain issues, such as gender identity, pornography, and prostitution, Wolf finds that the left has pretty much sold out women on these issues. We stand up for women and girls. And to the extent that Family Policy Alliance also stands up for women and girls on these issues, we'll work together. Autumn Leva replies, from our point of view, God made male and female, both in his image. And that's why, with your help, we will always oppose legislation that erases either sex from the law. Come on, how wrong does something have to be for a Christian, pro-family organization and a radical feminist organization to oppose it together? So back to this winter. At the end of December, Wolf and another feminist organization, Hands Across the Aisle, which is a coalition of anti-trans conservative and so-called feminist activists, joined the other ultra-conservative organizations that included Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, the anti-LGBTQ Institute for Faith and Family, anti-trans pediatrician Miriam Grossman, conservative former Secretary of Education turned talk show host Bill Bennett, the Christian Educators Association, four constitutional law professors, and anti-trans activist Walt Heyer to ask the Supreme Court to take the case in Boyertown, where cisgender students are asking the Supreme Court to say that the school district cannot protect trans students. And on the back of that brief, and on the eve of the introduction of the Equality Act in Congress, Wolf was invited to speak to Heritage Foundation about the specious dangers that the Equality Act poses to cisgender women and girls. And isn't it a coincidence, but these are the same dangers that Phyllis Schlafly warned that the Equal Rights Amendment would call down upon us. Men in every bathroom, with no recourse, the erasure of women as a protected class. The week of the Heritage Panel was celebrated by anti-trans feminist activists who literally flew in from around the world to capitalize on the 15 minutes of fame. You may recognize this shot of Sarah McBride from the Human Rights Campaign. She was ambushed by UK anti-trans activist Kelly J. Keen Minchel, who found Sarah while Kelly J. was visiting the Capitol to talk to members of Congress about the Equality Act. Kelly J, who goes by Posey Parker online, was on the Hill with other anti-trans feminist activists, thanks to Kara Dansky. And boy, did those meetings bear fruit. From those meetings, Julia Long was invited as the sole Republican witness during the subcommittee hearing on the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act and one of two witnesses for the Republicans during the full House Judiciary hearing on the Equality Act. Committee Republicans, including Louie Gohmert, 
and Debbie Lesko spent the hearings offering Julia Beck more and more time to repeat her conspiracy theories and lies about trans people. And when did those conspiracy theories and lies come back? Well, during committee markup, when Lesko and Gomert offered amendment after amendment after religious exemption after religious exemption to the re reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, citing continuously to the lies that Julia Beck had told in the supposed effort to protect women and girls. Julia met with Tucker Carlson on Fox News after her first stint as a congressional witness. Tucker said, I'm gonna do a Tucker voice. I can't do a Tucker voice. <laughs> I don't weigh in on this often because sexual politics is a morass. And it's not worth it to be totally honest with you, but I have enough daughters that I care. And my instinct has always been this change in our society, which we never debated, the terms have never been clarified, is not going to be good for girls in the long run. Let's play a little guessing game. How many daughters is enough daughters to care? If you think it's zero, raise your hand. You guys all win. If you think it's one, two, it's three. Tucker Carlson has three daughters, and that's enough for him to care. Thanks, Tucker. Here's Wolf again and hands across the aisle, and the Heritage Foundation, this time at the UN Commission on the, st on the uh, Status of Women in New York at the end of March. On your left, Monique Robles is an anti-trans pediatrician. Her work is cited by hate group, American College of Pediatricians, who oppose trans-affirming care for youth. Natasha Chart, she's a Wolf board member. Grace Melton in the center is Heritage Foundation's Associate for Social Issues and writes for Daily Signal. Kaylee Triller, second from the right, is a conservative co-founder of Hands Across the Aisle, who has worked with Family Policy Institute of Washington and the Massachusetts Family Institute to oppose trans protecting bills. And Nura Dean Knight here at the end is a scholar whose anti-trans writing focuses from a black Muslim female perspective. So, so we can talk, for example, about the Catholic childhoods and education of the two foremothers of anti-trans feminist rhetoric, Mary Daly and Janice Raymond and how their understanding of womanhood and gender essentialism triggered their fear of trans people, trans women specifically. We can also talk about how second wave feminism and lesbian separatism relied on distancing vaginas from penises in a similarly gender essentialist way. Um, we can also talk about how some women task themselves with policing gender and womanhood in order to draw the line around who should feel the brunt of patriarchy's violent recrimination for staying outside of our strict gender classes and who should be rewarded by the patriarchy for policing those lines and how all of these things fit very neatly into the right wing's desire for a wedge issue that separates minority groups off from the whole of our community so they're easier to pick off. And I, in fact, do talk about all of those things all the time, so follow me on Twitter, Heron G. But the more important question for us tonight is obviously, what do we do? So to figure that out, we're gonna take a closer look at Julia Beck's testimony at the Equality Act hearing in the House Judiciary Committee. I'm about to show you some very disturbing anti-trans rhetoric. So care for yourselves as, as, you, as you wish. It ha it's not an image, it's just what she said. I will not show it for very long. So I'm not gonna read any of it. What Beck 
and the Republicans who called her as a witness are using here is a rhetorical technique you may have heard of called the Gish Gallop. The term is named after creationist Duane Gish, who would argue for creation with like a barrage, right? Regardless of the veracity of his claims or the provability, with the express intent of forcing his opponents in his public debates to take the time to address each one of his absurd claims, diverting the focus from the real conversation, which was that we should teach uh, um, evolution in schools. So, at the Equality Act hearing, Beck's Gish Gallup had the same exact effect. Time and time again, each Democratic member of the committee was forced to introduce data into the record, to turn the mic back to other witnesses who can rebut Beck's claims. It started even before the hearing began because the committee Democrats knew that Beck would be there when Jared Nadler made a very impactful content note and message of hope for LGBTQ youth. He said, you're gonna hear some horrible things tonight but I want you to know that we see you, we love you, we be believe you, and we are here for you. I am glad that he said that, but he didn't need to say that. A congressional hearing should be focused on the legislation at hand. So the Gish Gallup and Beck's lies and conspiracy theories during the hearing and the right's deliberate platforming of anti-trans so-called feminists in general tell me one thing. The right does not have a single empirical argument against non-discrimination protections for transgender people. And so instead, they are using moral arguments. And in order to make a moral argument, there needs to be immorality. And in this case, trans people, and the Democrats, and the gender ideologists, such as they call us, who support them. So, a little bit of sociological research. So some research finds that people who are more likely to be conservative are also more likely to strongly respond to apparent threats, to their, the safety of their in-group. This can also be called the circle of empathy or the circle of moral concern. So Hierocles in the second century, he described individuals as consisting of a series of circles. You have your human mind, then your immediate family, extended family, local community, the community of neighboring towns, your country, and then finally, the whole human race. And Hierocles said that our task as empathetic humans was to draw all of the circles into the center transferring people to that inner circle of most immediate moral concern, making all human beings part of those who deserve empathy. Here's Hierocles' theory. Apologies for the gender essentialism myself. So as I said, there's some evidence that conservative people are more activated by fear and disgust more than people who are more likely to be progressive. And so conservative people draw thicker lines between the groups. And they look for specific ways to distinguish between people whom they include in their circles and whom they exclude. And it makes sense, this is directly related to the conserve in conservative, right? Conservative people believe that there is a scarcity of resources, that there is not enough in the world to preserve the safety and the health and the well-being and freedom from violence for everyone. And that means drawing lines. Conservation necessarily involves deciding who deserves safety and health and a life free from violence and who does not. And one big way to make that decision is through gender essentialism. So what does scarcity, conservation, gender essentialism, morality mean as we combat those who root their anti-trans activism in so-called feminism? It means we must bring nuance to the conversation. 
Nuance is exactly what draws broader communities into those closer circles of moral concern. Nuance allows us to turn moral arguments into ones about individual people not conspiracy theories about nameless, faceless devils who are coming to take our women and girls. And as always, nuance means personal stories. We must draw ourselves and those we love into our collective inner circles through nuance and love. So in that spirit, hi, my name's Heron. I'm a feminist, I am an atheist, I'm a not entirely cisgender person who benefits from whiteness. I'm a parent, and I'm a partner, and I'm a friend. And I am proud as a feminist to support the Equality Act and all legislation that prohibits discrimination based on gender identity because I understand that everyone has the right to use the bathroom in safety. And I understand that my own complex notions of comfort do not supersede the safety of those who are most impacted by the patriarchy. I demand that we lift the conversation about safety and comfort off of the backs of trans people and place it squarely where it belongs, on the patriarchal, capitalistic, gender essentialist complementarity that pretends we are defined by what is between our legs and that what is between our legs can somehow act as a symbol of our whole identity. <laughs> Cisgender women, trans women, trans men, non-binary people, and yes, even cis men share a common enemy whom we should be fighting. The patriarchy, who tells us that safety is scarce and comfort is paramount. No, I am nuance, you are nuance. I am an individual, my trans and non-binary family and friends are nuanced and individuals. Feminism is our ally. We must not let us be weaponized against us. Abundance is our hope. There is a future, nay, there is even a present in which we can all live in safety and I demand that we work towards it now. Thank you. <laughs>